Uh, thanks for coming tonight. So I'm going to give a talk and about my work, but it can be a little less formal. So if there's any questions, like technical questions, questions about how the work was made or what I'm thinking about it, please feel free to ask. It's much more interesting for everyone um, if it's a conversation. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, I work um, from the proposition that formal value is social value, that the way things are built and the way they're presented to us uh, accumulatively build the rules and kind of conversation of a civic discourse. And actually, this goes back to a conversation that we were having uh, during the workshop this afternoon. Rather than an interest in leveling out the social currencies between things as uh, historically, postmodernism has been interested in. I'm more interested in the hierarchies than they actually exist, perhaps exacerbating the hierarchies to make them more apparent. Um, the work is about the negotiation of value that we all go through uh, every day. Um, these inherent hierarchies, awareness of these uh, hierarchies, give us an awareness and definition, making the social relations between things and people that much more apparent, which I think is always a good thing. Um, as a society defines, decides the rules that it wants to hold. It's a, um, yeah, it's a t I always think of it as a kind of very messy, very subjective political theory that occurs within my own head and in my own studio. Um, I organized the lecture around a couple larger groupings. The work I'm going to present to you now, it's not, um, it is, um, what's the word? I'm sorry, I'm a little jet lagged all of a sudden. It's not grouped by um, time, but rather by kind of subject. And um, the next couple pieces that we're going to look at, I call hidden bodies. Um, this piece that we're looking at right here is called Public Sculpture Edits. It's made out of cast terracotta, which is the same thing um, bricks are often made of, and human hair. Um, to me, community space is claimed and defended by people who need one another. And it's an ideology, it's a worldview that's constructed through language. So the way we communicate as a group, as a collective, and as individuals forms our, are the rules of civic dialogue. So here we have a group of cast microphones that to me are both figurative elements. Um, I was looking at a lot of Giacometti when I made this piece. Um, that need to work as a collective, but also individual, just as we do. Here is a, um, a detail. Um, formerly, I was really interested in the kind of tension that's inherent in casting between raw material, in this case the brick of the terracotta, and autonomy, the figure. So I wanted to maintain a sort of tension where it could um, sculpturally hover between the two. Um, it's, uh, it's always a struggle in sculpture, particularly of finding the perfect balance of material and form and weight. And in this one, I wanted it to be um, not an ideal or a utopian, as casting, the artifact of casting is often used in uh, memorials, where you want to make a pristine one-to-one -one copy. Um, I wasn't so interested in that for this particular project, but as you can see here, all of it, the mode of production is really evident. There's lots of casting scenes, um, and you can see the way it was made. Um, and this is done by changing the signal to noise ratio and adding visual resistance. I didn't want it to be so smooth. It's not a one-to-one -one copy. This is an older piece called uh, Gold Chain's Headspace Freedom. Um, to my mind, art practice provides a space where, like I said earlier, community values debated. Uh, art can be pretty or it can be sad, it can be sexy or brutal, but it can never be abstract. To my mind, all art is representational. So um, these are forms that were based on the suicide watch cages that were at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, the naval base that was used during the Iraq War. 
Um, I filed, uh, in America you can file something called a freedom of information brief, which is where you can petition the government for information, and by law they have to give it to you. And so it's a very laborious process. The government makes it as difficult as possible to do, but I um, eventually received all the plans of Guantanamo. And they don't give you a layout, like you couldn't, you don't know where the buildings are in relationship to one another, so you couldn't you know, attack it or something like this, but you're given all the things individually, so you can put it together. And um, you know, I did this without really knowing what I was doing, I didn't really have a plan, but I, I saw these cages, and A, they're brutal. I mean, you can't sit down, you, you can't, you can, all you can do is turn around, and this is to keep you from killing yourself. And um, I was, I have to say, as a citizen, I was offended that you know, we had resorted to this. But it also struck me how much they looked, um, for the art nerds in the audience, they look like um, Morris Lewis or Bruce Nauman sculptures. And I was really taken by this relationship between these kind of canonized, macho, art historical sculptors and what these were used for um, in Cuba. <clears throat> um, within one of the smaller cage is a guitar amplifier that at the same time, so it's a, a sonic mashup between these two songs, it's playing Black Steel and the Hour of Chaos, which is a song by the um, uh, 1990s hip hop group Public Enemy, and In My Room, which is a song by Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys from 1967. Both of these songs, which are very famous in America, are about enlightenment through incarceration. One um, imposed by the state and um, the public enemy, and one a kind of bourgeois self-withdrawal into one's own room, into one's own headspace uh, in the Beach Boys song. And they play um, from, from the center of this cage. I had this cage gold-plated in, um, in real gold. And as you walk around it, as you walk around it, it um, produces a moire pattern, which is when um, the grids overlay one another. It kind of flickers in a way that um, is beautiful. And I was in the gold. Historically, gold has been a color that's been used about wealth. It's also been used in religious art for transcendence. And um, I was interested in how these things could implicate what these cages were used for. This is a, a very new piece. Um, and it's a, how long is it? It's a four minute and 42, um, 42 second video called Anthems, which I finished uh, in 2011. It's, um, it's been presented at a, a couple different times in a couple different venues, but it always has to be, it's in a black box, a very kind of traditional video space, but it always has to be larger than life size. That's the kind of only installation requirement for the piece. So something like this. Um, <clears throat> in America and probably many other countries, they have something in America called the Junior ROTC, which I can't actually remember what ROTC stands for. But it is a um, officer training program for the military. So if you're a kid, you enter ROTC, junior ROTC in high school. If you complete it uh, effectively, you are guaranteed a college education um, at a at university. If you then make a promise to be an officer in the military, either the Army or the Navy. And so it's a a ticket that is used oftentimes when children don't have the funding to attend a good school, they trade some of their time of their lives and um, to be, whoa, sorry. Don't worry about it. Oh, okay. Um, what was I talking about? Uh, right, so it's a trade off there their time for money. Um, and oftentimes, the children, like a lot of the high school kids I worked with, really had no idea 
what they were going to do in the military or what that meant for them. Um, they just knew that they wanted to get a good education. So I, there's, um, in the north of Chicago, there is a place called Rickover Naval Academy, which has a very famous drum corps. The drum corps is the military marching band of um, ROTC. So they play the drums, they march, they play national anthems. And I worked with them for about nine months, and this is a photograph of them here, um, making this video. <clears throat> In the video, a confrontational situation, both visually and sonically, is set up between groupings of musicians marching on a screen. Shifting in formation and in superimposed image, the marchers are simultaneously playing four different national anthems. The audio of the tracks of the performance are highly edited and mix of the sounds of the anthems are lost into a, a kind of wall of nationalistic sound. Um, over the course of the video, the sound and imagery build into a uh, crescendo excuse me, of incomprehension and then fade out into like a pure white abstract mark. So these kids are marching um, while playing these four different anthems. And then in post-production, I sync them up on top of one another like you see here and like you see here as the audio is as well. So the anthems, which are the American anthem, the North Korean anthem, the Belgian anthem, and the Venezuelan anthem are all synced up. So you just hear this very violent sort of drum and bass mashup of, of um, national of these national anthems but the way our lives are most often affected by power is through the kind of very boring power of the bureaucracy and I wanted to turn the camera as it were upon that <clears throat> in the United States there is a network a television network that is mandated um, by the US government called c-span and c-span every governmental meeting, Congress, Senate, um, not the judiciary, but um, the legislative section, and some uh, executive branches are broadcast on C-SPAN. And it's a kind of romantic idea of an open democracy, that everyone has access to how democracy is being exercised. It's not always the case, but that's the, that's the ethos. And C-SPAN is made in a format that we're, that we're all very familiar with, which is the three camera setup. It's exactly like how sitcoms are made. So you have an, uh, an overarching shot, you have an action shot, and you have a reaction shot. Those things are then edited and sent out over broadcast. A friend of mine um, works at C-SPAN in Washington, and he stole for me all three unedited reels of a congressional testimony, which in retrospect is interesting in that it had to do with housing interest rates right before the housing crisis in the United States. Um, <clears throat> so I took those, I took those reels of film and I made a, what I call a casting of them. I took them and with a group of actors on a soundstage in Los Angeles, I reenacted frame by frame the three reels and then broadcast them. I'm um, sorry, I projected them at the same time. So when you see you know, my Alan Greenspan, go, when Alan Greenspan goes like this, my actor Alan Greenspan does the same thing but in a more kind of theatrical uh, gesture. It, all three are projected like so. This slide's kind of bright. Still. While this is happening, <clears throat> the RGB breaks down to its um, armature function. So the video is made by red, green, and blue. As this video cycles through, the colors break down into their broadcast components. Um, this, to me, is harkens back to a f school of painting that came out of Washington, D.C. as well, called the Washington Color Field School, which is represented here by this Mor Morris Lewis painting. Also really interested in large washes of color, just as the video is. Mm. 
And there on the, uh, on the right, you see the, the blue channel. Um, I made a really short, I've only made one 16 millimeter film in my life. And it was a, it's a short film called Black Light, White Light, Dip Tick, which consists of two elements. One is, this is a still from a 16 millimeter film that's about four minutes, also about four minutes long. And it's a slowly, almost imperceptibly slow rotating diorama that I made in my studio. And it has um, fake plants, it has living plants. Um, there's a smoke machine. It's a very like hot temperatured image that is moving about this slow around. It takes all four minutes for it to take one circle. The other element of the diptych is a um, audio recording that is an unedited recording of an American politician by the name of Jesse Jackson um, giving a speech at the 1984 Democratic Convention in San Francisco, California, um, which I was at. And in the speech, he talks about um, America as the si shining city on the hill for some and the erotic jungle for other, when he meant to say exotic. And it became a very famous, it became a very famous Freudian slip that um, has been talked about many, many times in terms of like race relations in America, but also um, kind of um, 1980s um, political correctness, as it was termed. Like it was a very big scandal um, when he did it, and I. I remember being totally captivated. I was a young, I was really young at that um, convention. It was the first time I'd ever seen any kind of mass political grouping. And um, it stuck with me. And so this piece, I wanted to kind of unpack what, I, want, I think I, you know, in, after, in retrospect, I think I wanted to unpack what um, the other meant, you know, this kind of binary that he was setting up was really confusing to me. <clears throat> um, last year, I I got a research grant at school um, to do some research in the um, in the Reg, the library that's on the campus of the University of Chicago, and the university has um, an incredibly rich collection of 20th century political interviews. And um, I, um, at the same time, as I was asked to be in a show called Agitated Histories, which at a museum called Site Santa Fe, and the show was about reenactment and. Um, um, recreation. And so I put the two together. And what we're looking at here is, are two of five um, pigment prints where I went through um, group, these groupings of interviews and um, printed experts excerpts of interviews with political luminaries such as Castro, McNamara, and Reagan where I was attracted to where they discussed the failures of their own ideological system. So Castro talking about the failures of communism, Thatcher with the failures of, um, of capitalism. The resulting text, I stripped them down and removed um, them from context where they became pure kind of concrete poetry and then photographed them with a professional hand model as sort of broadcasts or advertisement um, like you see here. some source material that I was looking at when I was making these. I like the kind of personalization that um, signs can take on. Here's the group of five. Um, this is an earlier piece from 2008 um, called Fucking Up with the Sun. Excuse, excuse my French. Um, and it is um, 
protest signs. Um, there are protest signs when the protest is over um, uh, for the sublime, like this idea of a sort of eternal hopefulness and um, that sunsets have and like the end has. I was interested in where where that energy goes when the when the protest is over. <clears throat> um, as I said in the beginning of the talk, like I have a really long-standing kind of contentious relationship with abstraction, um, both as an artistic language but also a political construct. Um, how is politics rendered abstract, and how is abstraction made political, and how both politics and abstraction have used one another in the formation of social meaning. Um, I often go to press conferences, like um, for research, I go to like city hall meetings, press conferences, and things like this. I'm very interested in the kind of day-to-day -day of kind of the machine of politics and how it, how it affects us. Um, and um, this next project here was an outgrowth of some of one of those trips. In Chicago in 2008, a boy quite near the University of Chicago was murdered in front of his high school by the name of Darian Albert. This was captured on YouTube and went viral, went around the world. And even for Chicago, a city that has an unfortunate history of um, violence, people lost it. I mean, this was like the kind of classic, it was a tragic story. This was an honor student. He wasn't ganged up. Like, this boy was just at the wrong place in the wrong time. And um, I, went to, I, I went to the police conference where they were talking about this, you know, trying to catch the perpetrators and whatnot. Um, I happen to have a very high resolution camera um, when I went to this. I normally just take, you know, a point and shoot or something. And I took a lot of photos. And over the course of a year, uh, year or two, I, I kept on manipulating the image, like cutting it up, like literally cutting it up, working with it in Photoshop, um, making it very representational, making it very, very abstract. Um, and I, over time, my interest started to focus on the curtain backdrop behind the speakers. And um, eventually, it became this um, very abstract image that has been completely disconnected from its source. Um, and it became, for me, a sort of uh, how much can you take away and still have it connected to the social conditions from which it, it came out of? Like, when does abstraction take hold and the image becomes abstract? Or when does it become representational? How much do you need for it to be representational of another? Um, something else outside of it is um, something I'm still really kind of interested in and working on. This is quite large as well. Um, it is uh, 82 by 62 inches. Um, I made an ex exhibition last year called Inside Us All There Is a um, Part That Would Like to Burn Down Our Own House. And um, the, the last couple images I'm going to talk about are from that. This is an overall installation shot. Um, this is a, a quote. The psychopath only courts the other's death, and one must objectify an object or a, or a person in order to manipulate their material. So the objectification of another is necessary for kind of the alienated subject. Violence in war is an often shown but rarely talked about type of communication. It wasn't specifically, in, but if not in a specifically contemporary art context. I think these are universal human issues, both on the personal and the idea of protecting the self and the sovereignty of the body. But there's also a societal issue when violence is, when violence is justified, when it's necessary, and what it means to watch violence, to see violence. <clears throat> it's this relationship between attraction and violence and justification and repulsion and violence that this show kind of took up as its theme. Go back. 
the three sculptures on the pedestals are collectively entitled um, Modern Ensembles. And I, I said this earlier um, during the workshop. I worked on these pieces with a pyrotechnician, um, formerly of the Disney Corporation. He's the guy who made the fireworks that they would blow off every night in Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Anyone been there? Um, and with him, I developed a series of custom-made mortar charges of various chemicals that were then detonated within the voids of these plexi, uh, bulletproof plexi cubes. So there's no paint or pigment involved in anything that you see here. It's just um, different compositions of chemicals that when they oxidize, when the mortar shell explodes, they leave a residue within the void of the plexiglass cube. Um, so there's a detail. I wanted to make something that held a history of violence, but one that became like much like the um, um, police photograph became unmoored from its context, become a sort of free-floating signifier of like an aestheticized. It's an aestheticized violence that, where its history or its context has been totally removed, or becomes just an object. Um, I want to, I'm still not done with this project in a way, like I still hope to interrogate the kind of disconnect we have between cause and effect and violence um, in the contexts in which we are accustomed to seeing violence and those that we're not. Oh, that's it. Um, I just have a couple like closing notes that maybe we can start the Q&A from. The separation between politics and aesthetics has been like a significant feature of modern liberalism, like um, aestheticizing politics since um, modernism has been a project of the right, you know, like fascism and Nazism were incredibly invested in an aestheticized, um, an aestheticized politics. And within more liberal traditions, it's held with, uh, historically been held with a lot of suspicion. And I think this is, um, I think this, uh, there's a, an enormous poverty in this position. I think that there is a, a lot of space that can be investigated um, both as an artist, but also as as a community, like what are the what are the rules of kind of visual discourse within progressive Western liberalism, if you will, and how are they codified, codified, and codified aesthetically? Um, I think is a very open question and one that my work is like um, something that I'm working toward answering, at least for myself, or at least uh, I find it to be a rich a rich terrain. Um, having said that, my art, uh, I anyway do not conceive of my art as political art. I take politics as a subject matter, like I'm interested in politics and the regimes of politics, but I myself am not an ideologue and I don't, I don't um, think of my work as pursuing a particular agenda beyond one of investigation. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>